All right. Perfect. So welcome to ITSS Verona members series podcast. Colada and I are here from the China Asia team. Uh, today we are honored to have Howard Anglin, a uh, postgraduate researcher at Oxford University, um, an author with uh, McLeod, or sorry, McDonald Laurier Institute. Uh, Mr. Anglin was previously deputy chief of staff to Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, principal secretary to Alberta Premier Jason Kenney, and a lawyer in New York, London, and Washington, D.C. Uh, today's podcast, we'll be discussing Canada-China relations and your article, After the Gratitude Must Come the Reckoning. So um, welcome. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah. So um, in your article, you discuss Canada's policy on China being constrained, not just because of the, the two Michaels um, being used in hostage diplomacy, but also because there is a caution that any action against China would hurt Canada economically. Your article suggests that Canada isn't as weak as it thinks. Um, could you expand on that? Sure. Um, I don't want to pretend, and I, in the article I think I made it clear, that standing up to China doesn't come without costs. Of course it does. But I do think that China's ability to hurt Canada economically is often exaggerated. Um, and of course, China has an interest in exaggerating its leverage over Canada and the corporate interests in Canada, um, which have often a disproportionately large voice in our media, they also have an interest in exaggerating the danger because they're the ones who will be most directly affected, for which I have little sympathy, but that's another issue. Um, but while China is, of course, important to the Canadian economy, it's not like it's essential in the way that the United States is. Um, and diversification... Uh, could certainly compensate for a lot of potential losses. And I want to make it clear, I'm not talking about, and I don't think anybody's talking about a complete decoupling from China. I don't really like that word. We can get into that maybe later. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly not about losing all the economic benefits of engagement with China or China's participation in the global economy. I'm only talking about the actual harm that China could inflict in, on us it would only be a subset of the benefits we already have from economic engagement with China, which is itself not that big in, a, in the overall scheme of our economy. Um, and of course, another reason for, uh, for saying this is that um, trade sanctions hurt China too. Uh, they need what they're buying from us or they wouldn't be buying it. And most of the commodities that we trade are global commodities. And if China wants to buy from somebody else, at least in theory, that means there will be corresponding demand somewhere else. I know that reality doesn't work as neatly as economic theory, but that is still basically true. And um, we've also seen that in other countries where China has targeted, targeted them um, for economic retaliation, it's not like they've disengaged completely with the country. They have usually focus on one or two commodities or one or two products. So for example, in Australia, they targeted Australian wine with tariffs, yeah. but they didn't target iron ore because iron ore is actually really important to China. Um, so there are threats. They're not as big as I think some people make them out to be. And there are ways that the Canadian government can, of course, mitigate these threats and should um, mm -hmm. mitigate these threats. Um, and they need to be prepared to uh, defend our targeted industries like our farmers, our meat producers, our fishermen on the East Coast, um, and others that China has shown a willingness to target in the past. And it can do this in lots of ways. It could um, set up a funded body to market goods that have been targeted by Chinese boycotts to other markets, including providing incentives within international trade rules. Um, it could provide insurance for Canadian trade interests um, up to the point of backstopping losses. Um, and I think this is important. I mean, you think of all the money we spend uh, in Canada, this would not be huge amounts. It's a few hundred million dollars here or there, mm. but the benefit would be China could not use the suffering of one region or one industry to divide us as a country. Um, this is something that we saw when uh, China targeted canola interests and, um, and some of the meat interests in the prairies of Manitoba in last year. There were some industries and even some premiers, I think, who wanted to speak up and criticize the, the federal government and Trudeau for his handling of um, relations with China. And at the time I was working for Premier Kenny in Alberta 
he was adamant around the premier's table that this is not something that provinces should be doing. Canada has one foreign policy and set by Ottawa. Provinces don't freelance on foreign policy. And I think China, uh, sorry, Ottawa can make it a lot easier by making it clear that when an industry or a province is targeted, they will be there to backstop them and, and sort of keep the team together and, and uh, prevent China from uh, dividing us and pitting us against each other, which they're very, very effective at doing or trying to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the medium term, we should aggressively prioritize new markets for our products, uh, including being prepared to make concessions, perhaps in trade deals that we wouldn't have been prepared to make before uh, on our own end in terms of opening up our own market. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of dairy concessions, of course. Um, and we can spend more money to develop things that China uh, produces already, like rare earth minerals. Um, we have those here. It's just hasn't been cost effective to produce them. But when you add in the costs, the non tangible, the non economic cost of doing business with China, suddenly those costs don't seem as serious. Um, that would help build our resilience and also general resilience around the world. Um, so, no, I don't deny there will be costs, uh, especially in a time of economic stagnation when governments are looking to squeeze every fraction of a percent of GDP growth every year. The difference yeah. between 1.8 and 2 or 1.9, 2.1 is huge. Um, but I believe that the costs are exaggerated on the one hand. And more importantly, and we can get in, into this, I think the costs are worth it in non-economic terms. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, you state that China's foreign policy includes use of coercion. How important do you think it is, especially that the two Michaels are home uh, for Canada and its allies, as you say, uh, face down China now? So yes, of course, Chinese foreign policy incorporates uh, coercion um, above and beyond the normal economic um, coercion that's um, normal in geopolitical affairs. The two Michaels are not the first to be used as pawns by China in this way. Um, before them, of course, uh, there was Kevin and Julia Garrett who were arrested and held hostage in Chinese prisons uh, is retaliation for the pending extradition of Su Bin in Canada. Um, they've done similar things to other countries in recent years, including Japan. And of course they use uh, trade sanctions as a direct tool of punishment um, as we saw last year in Canada, but we've also seen uh, in Australia and Japan. So we need to recognize that that's a reality and we need to be prepared to stand up to it. As I said, I don't like the word decoupling, but I think one way we can stand up to China is, is being prepared to set limits. I prefer to use the word limits. There must be limits with our engagement with Chinese economy and the Chinese regime. And if we've already overstepped those limits in some areas, we need to be prepared to pull back. Um, but I think the important and crucial point here is those limits should be set by what we're not willing to tolerate as a cost of entangling our economic and political interests further with the Chinese regime. Um, so there are benefits to economic integration, of course, but the limits I'm talking about should not be defined by the benefits. Uh, they must be defined by the costs of engagement. We have to ask ourselves, what costs are too high for us to accept, even in exchange for significant economic benefits? And uh, I would categorize those in a few ways. Um, so the costs of our engagement with China include social and economic costs. Mm -hmm. um, globalization, outsourcing, offshoring of, of our large parts of our economy have created social economic divides in the West, which we're suddenly starting to see in the last decade. We started to see the effects of that. Um, they fed into rising domestic political concern and political unrest, and even the darker sides of, of um, political populism. Um, those are costs to doing business um, with China and other countries, but China is obviously the, the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. um, there are obviously security downsides. Um, the obvious ones are intellectual property theft and transfer, uh, weakening our IT systems and uh, influence and even corruption of our political systems. But there's the more general problem that the more economically interdependent we are with China, the more leverage the Chinese regime has over us when it comes to our political operating room, both at home and on the world stage. So our policies become limited by their interests not the other way around. Um, and then finally, and this is, I got into this in the article, um, there are moral downsides to doing business with China. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the most important cost. 
And it's one of the least talked about in IR circles because IR scholars usually fancy themselves far too sophisticated to talk about things like morality. Um, but the more we engage with the Chinese regime, mm -hmm. the more we become complicit in its abuses. It's multiple genocides, multiple ongoing genocides. The Uyghurs, obviously, Tibet, Falun Gong, um, its religious persecutions, and the construction of its state surveillance and social credit system, which, as we've seen in recent years, now has the ability to reach even Canadian citizens, Chinese-born Canadian citizens or dual citizens in Canada. So if we can't justify our policies towards China in moral terms, then the economic case is irrelevant. And that's why I included the anecdote about um, Allen and Foster Dulles uh, doing business in Germany in the 1930s. I don't want to belabor the point, but it makes the point. And so I think we need to decide what our limits are, what we're not prepared to do, even for economic benefit. And then once we've set those limits, we need to police them with policies that will enforce them on our side. And this includes tools that will um, target both Chinese regime actors, but also Western businesses doing business in China, if they step over the lines as well, like personal sanctions, travel bans, mm -hmm. uh, denying um, Chinese officials who are complicit in abuses access to our country, to our housing markets, to our schools, to our universities, to Western banking and financial markets, um, seizing their property in Canada, and measures that target both Chinese and Western companies that are complicit in state abuses like forced labor, suppression of speech. Uh, we need sanctions against tech companies, uh, social media companies, manufacturing companies, clothing companies who profit from participating in China's abuses. So it's a very long answer, I'm afraid, but uh, we need all these ways. We need to know what we're prepared to tolerate in our dealings with China. And then we need the tools to actually ensure that both China abides by them to the extent we can control them. And obviously it's in Canada alone, so it has to be multilateral. But then most importantly, we can control what Canadian citizens and Canadian companies do. And there have to be consequences for Canadian companies and Western companies that do business in China uh, and turn a blind eye to their abuses or actually contribute to them. Right. right. Thank you very much. And our third question is related to Huawei, because um, uh, before, when the two Michaels were still under uh, uh, under um, China, in China, um, the the Canadian government was more hesitant in banning Huawei. But now, a recent uh, survey uh, demonstrated that 75% of the Canadian population would like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau to actually ban Huawei. So, what's your perspective on this, and what do you think is going to happen in the future? So I don't think it's a close decision. I mean, we're clearly the laggard here among our peer countries. Um, obviously, we have to ban Huawei from our from our networks. Uh, it should have been done two or three years ago. I think it was a mistake not to do it earlier. Um, on the one hand, I understand the Canadian government's hesitance um, while the two Michaels were imprisoned in China. On the other hand, the two Michaels were very clearly being held in retaliation for the legal proceedings against Meng Wanzhou, not about Huawei being used in our network. And I think we could have taken that as a leverage point off the table if we just said no two years ago or three years ago. Um, so I'd like to say that the current government will obviously make the right decision. Um, but the fact that they still haven't done so even after the two Michaels are home really makes me wonder what the heck they are waiting for at this point. So I think it's a clear choice. I have no idea why they haven't made it. Uh, and then we wanted to ask you something that you stated in your article. Uh, you did say at some point that uh, Canada is sort of uh, left behind uh, from most of the international alliances. And you suggest that this should hand. It should hand in the future, it should change. So we just wanted you to expand on this point and maybe to ask you which international alliances in particular you think uh, Canada should join. Sure. So I think we need to start with protecting the organizations and defending the organizations of which we're already a member. So take the CPTPP. Um, we should absolutely oppose China's membership. Um, we cannot make the same mistake that we made 20 years ago with the WTO. Um, and especially we can't make the same mistake for the same reason, which was the naive hope that China would actually be constrained by the rules of the organization. Um, and then looking at a sort of more recent 
development, we should at least be at the table in the quad, um, the quadrilateral, quadrilateral security dialogue. Um, with respect to AUKUS, or however we're pronouncing that now, um, it's something we should think about. We should certainly, I think, be talking to the other members to see to what extent we could play a role, but it's still new and I think we have time there. And I think what's important about AUKUS is it looks like it's not just a military alliance because it seems to, it encompasses things like, or at least they've talked about things like AI, uh, quantum computing, intelligence sharing among the countries. And Canada is actually a global leader uh, in AI and to some degree in quantum computing. So we should look for ways to contribute in that way, even if it's not necessarily militarily. Um, we have to think about what we can bring to the table and be useful. And some of that will have to be military uh, or else we can't really be taken seriously in the other areas. But it's an unfortunate truth that Canada is just really bad at military procurement these days. And you look at something like what the Australians are agreeing to, to do uh, as part of joining AUKUS uh, in their procurement of nuclear submarines, um, nuclear powered submarines. Like even thinking about Canada trying to do that um, it makes me shake my head. Uh, that said, we do need to replace our current submarine fleet, um, which is already embarrassingly small. Um, we need to think about a three ocean strategy there. Um, we, the current submarine fleet probably has a useful life of about 15 years from now. And coincidentally, that's about how long it takes to do a major procurement in Canada, if we're lucky. So we do need to start making decisions about that independent of AUKUS, but obviously that now has to be brought into the picture. Um, we obviously have no idea what the world's gonna look like in 15 years. If you tried to plan for 1990 and 1975, it would have been useless. If you tried to plan for 2005 and 1990, it would have been hopeless. Um, we don't know if this will be a world where China's invaded Taiwan, where climate's causing greater disruptions than currently, um, more pandemics, migration pressures, global supply chains could be even more frayed than that. We have no idea what 15 years is gonna bring, but that means we have to stick to as simple decisions as possible. We have to reduce the decisions to what we can be somewhat confident of. And those are, I would suggest for what are our core principles as a country? Um, so what do we believe? I guess three questions. Um, which other countries share those core principles? Mm -hmm. And how can we best work with those countries to promote those principles? Um, these can be difficult sometimes when they differ, uh, where say our allies are pursuing principles that we disagree with. Um, so for example, I think Jean Chrétien was right to keep Canada out of the Iraq war, even though the Americans are a natural ally and the UK is a natural ally and they were participating. Um, there are sometimes hard decisions there, but when it comes to an alignment with Australia, the United Kingdom, um, the United States, Japan, to a lesser degree, India and the EU, um, I don't think it's a tough choice for Canada. We cannot be non-aligned as between the Chinese Communist Party and those countries. The gulf in our principles is just too great. Um, and so great that I think it's worth sacrificing some of the soft economic interests that we have uh, to maintain tough, but hard and important, crucial principles. Um, to put it bluntly, we should be able to say that we're gonna forgo some cheap goods as the price of opposing genocide. So, so yeah, the, we'll have to look at each organization and what we can bring to it. We do have things we can bring to it, the things we may have to do, new spending, military intelligence, et cetera, uh, in order to actually step up and be a full player there. These are things we've largely neglected for the last 30 years in Canada under conservative and liberal governments. Um, and we need to do a much better job of re-engaging with our allies uh, both so that we can be aligned with them, but also so we can ensure that their actions also align with our principles, or at least have some say in that. Okay. Thank you so much. You make a, you make a very clear point in that. <laughs> Would you like to add something, uh, Sandra? No, it's, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll just add one thing more thing. <laughs> the the one, count, one counter that you hear a lot recently about why we need to make more concessions to China is that we need to play nice with them 
to win concessions from them on climate change. And I just don't buy this. Um, either China recognizes that climate change poses an existential global threat, including to its own territory and its own people, or it doesn't. If it does recognize the threat of climate change, then it will act out of self-interest eventually. Um, and if it doesn't, then all the commitments in the world they make will be useless because they won't abide by them. So, I mean, I see this as like your roommate threatening to burn down your apartment if you aren't nicer to them. Like either he realizes that if the apartment burns down, you're both homeless or he doesn't. Uh, so uh, that's one one counterpoint I've seen to, to my argument online uh, that I wanted to, uh, to clarify my position on. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you.